things and ties to him. Father, we thank you for your generosity and your mercy and your grace and your love. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have a God that's very powerful. In 1 John, it talks about God sent light into this dark world, into the world of men, that there's darkness, but men chose not to receive the light they chose to reject the light so i hope this morning you won't be just men and women of the world but you would choose to embrace the light to allow jesus christ to come into your life examine your life clean up your life give you new purpose god is powerful he is very full of light and we hope that you will see his glorious face the choir will sing about our most high god and how he is holy. The name of the song is Holy.
Amen. God is holy. And our Lord is returning again. We need that expectant attitude here as we continue to walk with the Lord and serve him. I want to put a little special shout out this morning. We have some uh, newlyweds who are worshiping with us this morning for the first time on, at Cornerstone on Sunday morning since their wedding ceremony. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Jeremy and Anna Jung. That's pretty good. You guys were strategic trying to be behind a post where I wouldn't see you, huh? But I saw you earlier. About 30... Plus years ago, I was attending college in the East Bay, and uh, the first year I was out there, I commuted, okay? came from San Francisco, drove out to Hayward, and um, uh, I, was, I wasn't working at that time, and everything is kind of just, I don't remember all the details, but I used to drive this beat up Volkswagen, some of you might remember that, and, um, and I didn't have any money, okay? I had to go to school. I rushed out of the house. I had some gas in my tank, and I drove over to the East Bay, and I didn't have money for the bridge to get back, okay? This was before fast track and all that, okay? And, um, and I remember I was over there, and after my classes were done, I had to come back home. And I didn't have money to get across the bridge, and I didn't know. I guess if you, back then, if you didn't have money, they'd stop and take your license down and you know, all that sort of stuff and send you a bill or something. I didn't know. I just figured they wouldn't let you go. You, know, you don't have the money. So, um, so I prayed and I said, Lord, I don't know what to do. And I wasn't really, I'm not going to try to pretend, oh, I, Lord, you know, provide for me. I wasn't, I was like, Lord, I don't have any money and I need to get back home. You know, what can you do for me type of thing, you know? And so I didn't hear a voice from God. I didn't open the scriptures immediately. I, I was just, I had this impression that God wanted me to go to the 7-Eleven that was located nearby the, the school. So I went to the 7-Eleven, and as I went there, you know, once I got there, okay, I didn't say, oh, now, Lord, what do you want me to do? I just got out of my car, and I started looking on the sidewalk there for money, okay? <laughs> And here was a quarter here, and then I found a dime here, and here's another quarter here, and another dime. It was 70 cents at the time. You guys remember when the bridge was 70 cents? It was really strange, but anyway, it was 70 cents to get across the bridge. And I found my 70 cents, so I just kind of said, thank you, Lord. I didn't make a big deal out of it or anything like that. I didn't really even, it was kind of a blur, you know. I mean, I didn't even think about it much over the years. I just remember that, that time there and, um, and got, you know, provided for what I needed to get back. And sometimes we don't know what God is doing. We don't know how he's providing for us. We don't know how he's leading us, but we still need to trust him, right? And we need to trust him as we serve him because through his spirit, he's leading us into the ministry that he has for us, even if we don't quite understand it. And when I say ministry, I use that term, not just talking about somebody who's in full-time service, but I'm talking about each one of us individually has a ministry, that God gives us, right? We serve in particular areas. That's our ministry. And so uh, this morning, that's the, the reminder to us to trust God as he leads us uh, into spirit-led ministry for his glory. Real quick, and I kind of, you know, thought of this as, as I was thinking about the 7-Eleven thing and stuff like that. If you ever need any money around here, okay, you could probably come and ask somebody and they'd probably help you out. But if you have some pride, check over by the fence there, okay? <laughs> One time, $100 bill, 
Whoa, now you want to go, huh? <laughs> One time, a $20 bill. One time, a $5 bill. Just this past two weeks ago, I was out there, and, and I look all the time now, right? <laughs> and there was, an, there was a $1 bill there, you know? So it's a $1 bill. Praise the Lord, right? Um, and, and while you're at it, you can pick up the trash, too, okay? So that's kind of just an aside. But... Um, Sorry, I had to digress there. But so what we're going to do is we're going to go into 2 Corinthians chapter 2 because we're looking at the Apostle Paul's letter there and what he's been saying to the Corinthians. And if you remember last week, we talked about, you know, acting in grace. His thoughts were towards them. His actions were towards them. His planning was towards them with grace, you know. And, and as, he, he, as he did that, you know, he talked to them about, you know, this, this one person that, uh, you know, was in sin. And they, they, they brought judgment on this person within the church. And what I mean by that, they confronted this person with their sin. And we think it was, you know, the commentators think it was, you know, the, the person in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 who was, you know, sleeping with his father's wife, okay, you know, his stepmom, okay? And so um, we think that's who they were dealing with. And so the majority of the church dealt with this person in such a way that they were confronted with their sin. And it seemed to say that Paul was saying this guy repented now. And so the, the idea in, in dealing with somebody's sin is that you want to confront their sin, not so that you can just throw judgment on them, but so that they can repent and there's restoration, Right, because that's what God is about, right? He, he, he points out our sin to us so that we'll know of his uh, uh, forgiveness, we'll know of his mercy, his restoring power that is found in the blood of Jesus Christ. And so uh, the apostle Paul talked to them about that and as he was telling them those things, he was also explaining to them why his plans had changed or how his plans had changed. And so we're going to pick up as he continues on with this in uh, 2 Corinthians, starting in verse 12, and we'll go through uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 12, and we'll go to verse 17, okay? So uh, follow along with me if you, ooh, okay, hey, okay, I got it, all right? All right, good, good, okay. So, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, you can follow along with me in your Bibles or on the screens there. When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was opened for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. So Paul, as he's explaining this to them, he's saying, hey, okay, I started off, and he says, I, I, when I came to Troas to preach the gospel. See, he has some intention there. He goes to this place to preach the gospel. Um, the commentators seem to think that it was after he, he left Ephesus, and he's heading in this direction. And so he goes to this place, Troas, and he's to preach the gospel of Christ there. And it says, even though there's a door that was open to him, all right, his spirit was not at rest because he didn't find his brother Titus there. So somehow or another, you know, we come to understand that Paul was there. He wanted to meet Titus there. He wanted to meet Titus there after Titus had delivered the letter there to the Corinthians and get a report from them. But Titus isn't there. And Paul's reason for going there was to preach the gospel there. But there seems to be also this other, other uh, intention there of meeting up with Titus. And as he's there and he's ready to, to preach the gospel there, God gives him an open door. But there's something bothering Paul. He doesn't see his friend. He's worried about him. And, and, and the, 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 the thing is that Titus went there to the Corinthian church there to give them the letter and also to probably take up an offering. Because as I, as I told you before, there was this offering that was being taken up for the Jerusalem church there. And so... Somebody had to bring that money there. And so Titus was given that, that responsibility. So Paul's concerned about him because he's not where Paul thought he was going to be, which is in Troas. 
And maybe he got jumped or jacked along the way and somebody took, you know, the offering. Maybe something happened to Titus. He doesn't know, but he's bothered by it. And so much so that even though he has this opportunity to preach the gospel there, he can't. He can't because he's troubled inside his soul. It says his spirit is not at rest. That's kind of strange coming from the Apostle Paul. Because as we think about him, there's this guy that nothing seemed to hinder him, right? It was shipwreck, it was beatings, it was floggings, it was all this sort of stuff. But he kept on persevering and preaching the gospel. We don't really, kind of, we don't really focus on stuff like this where he talks about his tr- he's troubled in his spirit. That it's bothering him so much so that even though he has this opportunity, he decides to leave. That's pretty heavy duty for somebody who's a preacher. You know, he's like, hey, what, what am I doing here? It's this opening here, but I, I'm, I'm bothered inside. Uh, and as you read 2 Corinthians, if you get into chapter 4, you'll see that he talks about being, you know, being pressed, right, but not crushed, being persecuted, right, not abandoned. And so we get our trading, our sorrow song out of that, right? That's where it comes from, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And he talks about all these things. And so even though he's beaten down, he's not beaten completely. And he feels this. And so he, he, he's, he's bothered by it. So much that he leaves there and he, he heads on to Macedonia. So as he continues to head up and head, head north and head, head west there, you know, he must have had some sort of uh, understanding with Titus that they would follow a, 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 a prescribed plan there as to how they would travel so that if for some reason or another they needed to try to catch up with each other, they would travel on the right path so they could run into each other. So... Paul is, is moved here with this so much that he, he says, I took leave of them and I went on to Macedonia. Now, he's explaining to these Corinthians in this letter what's happened, why he's taken the course he's taken. And sometimes we don't understand, you know, what God is doing and why he's doing it. But Paul has this priority here. Even in preaching the gospel, he recognizes a concern for a fellow brother in Christ. So much so that it's, this is bothering him, he can't even preach the gospel. And, and this is hard for uh, some of us to take because some of us are just really task-oriented people. We just want to get the job done. And I'm like that sometimes. You know, I just want to get to the finish line. I just want to get it done. And along the way, you got people that you're dealing with. And you can't, you can't forget about that concern. You can't forget about their hearts and all of this. And so here it is, he's saying here that, you know, as he's talking and as he's thinking about the ministry that he has, his spirit is not at rest because of, 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 of Titus. And because of that, he moves on to somewhere else. So I think one of the things that we need to understand about God and how he leads us in our ministries is he wants us to make sure that we're taking care of one another in it. We're taking care of the people we're ministering to. We're taking care of each other. It's not let's just get to the finish line and let's just forget about one another and I don't care about you and and that doesn't matter to me. I'm just here to serve the Lord. That's not supposed to be the attitude. I remember... You know, one of, uh, one of the brothers before telling me a long time ago when he went on this, this tour, you know, he, he, he was thinking about the people there and he knew he didn't get along with some of those people. So he told him, you know, he says, I, you know, if I get along with you, that's fine. If I don't get along with you, that's just fine too. I'm just here to serve the Lord. And I don't think that's necessarily right, Okay. This doesn't seem to be like that with the Apostle Paul. And I think all of us would say, man, we got to get the gospel out there. That's got to be front and center above everything else. Yes, but there's got to be this concern for one another as well. So Paul is dealing with this with, 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 with Timothy, I mean with Titus, and as he's struggling with it, he moves on. He goes to Macedonia. And some of the commentators think, well, maybe this was that call where the Apostle Paul saw in this dream this man in Macedonia that said, come on over to Macedonia and help us. And so that's why his plans changed. We're not exactly sure. But for whatever reason, he felt that this was what he needed to do. And he picks up in verse 14 and he understands that even though maybe he didn't understand why it was all happening at the time, he comes to understand God's sovereignty in his hand that's involved in the plans that he has for him. 
So he says here in verse 14, he says, um, uh, but thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. So he's recognizing God is the one who's leading him. God is the one who's, who's leading him. And he comes here and he, allu- uh, he references actually this idea of this triumphal procession. And so back in those days, whenever the Roman army would go in and win a battle, uh, they, would, they took a city or whatever, they would have this big parade, kind of like when the when the Giants win the World Series, I won the World Series, they have this big old victory parade. Or if the 49ers should happen to win the Super Bowl, they have a big victory parade, right? And it's this big victory parade where you celebrate these people. And in those times, what they did, the army did, is they would, the general would lead the parade there, and all the soldiers would be behind. And in and back, in chains, would be the captives, all right? They were the ones who, were, who, who just got conquered. And it's funny how Paul uses this picture because we know that the scriptures say that we're like a servant of Christ, right? We're like a slave of righteousness. But we wouldn't ever really think of ourselves as being kind of at the back of the line like this, right? We're all chained up and we're following at the back there like this, that we're the ones who've been beaten down. It's funny because he's saying praise, but thanks be to God in Christ who always who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. So he's partaking in this triumph as well. He's partaking in it. So I think it's kind of like, it's funny because Paul recognizes that God's grace has just overwhelmed him and brought him to this point of repentance, right? And come to accept Christ and follow after him. And in doing that, he's not seeing himself as somebody who's been conquered down in a bad way, but somebody who's come to see the light so that he's in the parade, maybe going, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, pointing to, to the Lord, right? Pointing to the Lord and giving him thanks, giving him praise, giving him glory. So as he does this, he says, there's this triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of knowledge of him everywhere. So they said that when they would do that, they would burn incense along the way too. So they'd have this, this smell and all this sort of stuff there so that, so that you know, everybody knows this is a victory parade and, and everything like that. And here's this you know, incense that's being burned and here's this all smelling good and everything like that. And he uses this to kind of talk about the parade, but I think he's also talking about the idea of, of this sweet aroma that goes up to God. You see this in the Old Testament, that whenever somebody, uh, uh, you know, offered something to God, that the, the, these things that were being burnt up, these burnt offerings, were like a sweet aroma that goes up. So if you ever done barbecue, you know, burgers and stuff, like, hey, for real, right? That's it, right? The fat belongs to God. That's the stuff that sizzles and smells and goes up there. That's how it's supposed to be. But, we, of course, we want to eat all that for ourselves. But, yeah, you know, it's barbecue. It's like that. It's a smell that's going out there. And so Paul is, I think, talking about this idea, too. And he's talking about this aroma. He says, thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. And through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. So the picture is... God is leading, wherever he's leading, right, wherever he's leading, the knowledge of Christ, the knowledge of who God is in Christ is being spread out. And that's what we are a part of. Apostle Paul is saying this for himself, and it goes to the bigger side of things that it includes us as well as Christians. That God does that, that we are this fragrance, we are this aroma. But listen what happens. It says, he, he spreads this, uh, the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere, for we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. It's the same aroma. It's not a different smell. Like, you smell like that, and you smell like that. It's we all smell this aroma. We're all this aroma. We are this, this fragrance, and it's the aroma of Christ, but it's, it's perceived differently by different people. So that to those who are, it says here, uh, for we are the aroma of Christ of God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. So as we share the gospel, as we let the knowledge of God permeate our lives and and be proclaimed through our, our mouths and our lives as well, that as we do that, 
people hear the message of the gospel, some of them think it's crazy. They see Jesus as some guy who was a religious guy who got beat up, he got crucified, and he got thrown in a tomb. End of story. Right? For whatever reason, they're blinded. They don't see it. They don't see the truth. To people who respond to it, it's this aroma of life. You proclaim the gospel and those who, whose eyes are open hear it, receive it, and it's life to life. So something that's interesting in this for us as Christians, we hear the message of the gospel. We know the message of the cross. Sometimes you say, oh, I've heard all that before. Eh, it's kind of, you know, you preach it all the time, Scott, or whatever, you know. I think the, the point in this is we got to re remember that that's the message that freed us. That's the message that reminds us that we belong to God, that we walk with him. And so Paul is saying that this is what we're doing. This is how God is leading us. This is what, this is what he's doing. And sometimes we don't understand it, right? We don't understand the, the twists and the turns. And I think Sandra used the term roller coaster, right? Right? Because that's how it is too, right? Sometimes like a roller coaster. When, when we get with God, sometimes we think it's going to be like those people movers in the airport. They're all flat. They're steady. They just take your cross like that. But sometimes it's like a roller coaster, right? And then you get off and you say, well, that was fun. I'd like to do that again. Or some of you get sick, right? Some of us get sick. What am I saying? I'm saying that when God's leading us, sometimes it's smooth and sometimes it's wild. But because it's God who's leading us, he's leading us in triumphal procession, right? That wherever we are, we can be his fragrance. We can be his, his uh, servants. We can be his, his witnesses. And I think that's what he wants from us. As we continue on here at the end of verse 16, the apostle Paul says, who is sufficient for these things? So remember, he's also responding to some criticism there. And there's somebody who's there, some, some teacher or something that's gone there, and somehow or another pointed fingers and said, Paul is not that good, or he doesn't know this, he doesn't have good rhetorical skills, or he's not a great you know, orator, or any of this sort of stuff. And so Paul is, is, is dealing with this because he's saying, hey, who is sufficient for this? And when we think about the message of the gospel and the responsibility that we have, it's very heavy duty, right? Because it's, it's hard to make that clear to somebody who doesn't understand. Even though we think, oh yeah, it's really good. You tell the story and they get it. Hey, sometimes we get all tripped up and people just like, I don't know what you're talking about. Sometimes the preacher's all messed up. Sometimes the people are all messed up, all right? But it's always hard. And this is what the Apostle Paul is saying. If you want to talk about sufficiency or worthy or fit, as another translation, or competent, as some translations have, he's saying, hey, nobody is really fit. That's why he asked the question, you know, who is sufficient? It's rhetorical with the intended answer of saying nobody is. Maybe there are these guys that have said, yeah, we're good. You know, look at us talk. Look at us do this. And we're skilled and we're, we're competent to do this. Paul is not. Paul is saying, look, if anyone thinks they are, they're probably not, right? Kind of like, I'm so humble. If you say you're humble and you're, you're, you're being proud of being humble, you're usually not humble. That make sense? So it's kind of like that. And so he's saying, hey, who's sufficient for this? Nobody really is. And he gets into it and he says, look, it, these guys here, we are not like so many um, so many uh, peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. So Paul is saying, hey, I'm not like these guys. I'm not going to be like these guys. There are some people out there who want to make money off the word of God. And, you know, this is very difficult. Sometimes we look at this and we say, hey, these guys, you know, especially and those of us who've been around for a while and we've seen like televangelists and all these, you know, different people who fall in and who turns out, you know, they, they've taken money and done all these different stuff with it. We look at them and we say, hey, you know, those guys are, you know, peddling God's word. And so who should we trust? Should we trust anybody anymore? We're not given to anything because they might be, quote, unquote, peddlers of the word of God. It's good to be discerning. You know, Paul was discerning as well. But one of the things that he said in the book of Philippians, if you remember, he says, I don't care what their motive is. 
right? I'm concerned that the gospel gets out because once the gospel gets out, for whatever reason, people will get saved, even if people's motives are bad. So the point in this is like, if you've ever given anything to a ministry that's kind of gone belly up or didn't work out or whatever, turns out somebody was cheating there, you know, that they were proclaiming the gospel, yes, you should be more discerning, okay, but don't beat yourself over the head with it and say, hey, you know, never again, because I don't think that's the right attitude. I think it's just, it's just important for us to understand that God will even use those sorts of things to get the word out. So we want to commit whatever we give to God and to his, and to his work, you know, commit that to God, ask him to use it, and we definitely want to give to uh, worthy ministries that are, you know, doing what they're supposed to be doing and getting the word out. Like this one here, okay, like this one, okay. So Paul says, hey, you know, we're not peddling this stuff here. We're not, we're not selling God's word. We're not just gathering a crowd here. And we're going to have this great speech there, and I'm going to go around and, and put up the offering plate here and have you, you know, drop in money there, and I get to take that, and that, that's mine because that's what do me and all that sort of stuff. He says we're not doing that. But what we do is we serve, we, 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 we preach the word with a sincerity of heart, he says, Right? But as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. So you're saying, hey, God called me to do this, but I'm doing this out of a pure motive as well. So we talked about this idea of sincerity before. It talks about being pure in our motives. So why is it that we, what, what, why is it that we should be proclaiming the word of God or doing what we're doing in our service to God? It should come from a pure motive of saying, I want to do what God wants me to do. I want to share the love of God with folks. And that's what we're doing. So all this to say is that as Paul is going through it all, he's saying, hey, look, at you know, there are going to be some twists and turns, just like in my ministry, and I'm telling you guys about this, the twists and the turns that have taken place. It's not just because I'm just kind of going off and not thinking about anything. I had some plans, but God did something else in those plans. God chose to do this instead of what I originally intended. And he used these things to do it. But it's all because of what he's doing. It's because the way he's leading us. It's God who's leading us. And he's the one who's, who's causing his glory to be made known as we follow in submission to him. And make sure that as you do that, that you're doing that with a pure motive. And that's what Paul is saying. He's saying, trust God to lead you by his spirit into ministry that is glorifying to him. And even if you can't understand it all, because sometimes we can't. Why did I go to 7-Eleven? I don't know. I just felt like that's what God wanted me to do. I didn't have a plan. I'm going to go there and rob the store. I didn't have a plan that I was going to look for somebody and ask them for money. Otherwise, I would have tried to do that at the school. I was too afraid to ask anybody for money, too ashamed. So I went looking around on the street. See what I mean? And sometimes God does stuff like that. Paul didn't know. He's troubled in his spirit. But God was the one who's leading them from Troas to Macedonia. He ends up finding out in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, we end up finding out that he meets up with Titus and it brings comfort to him, right? Because God is the one who's leading. So trust the Lord as he leads us by his spirit in the ministry that he has for each one of us and don't worry about whether you can answer all the questions or not. Trust in the Lord. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your guidance in our life in ways that we don't even understand. You move us to do things, Lord. You impress it upon us to act in certain ways. Not that all of our actions are, are, are right and good. That's not what's being said here, Lord. But the fact is that there are some things that we don't know why we have to do certain things but it's because you are leading us into those things, whether we would have thought that for ourselves or not. And so because it's that way, Lord, we only know that we commit ourselves to you. We follow your word. We trust in, in the guidance that you give us in your word and the wise counsel of others and also the guidance that you give us by your spirit in our souls. As Paul shared, he did not experience rest in his spirit. Sometimes we're anxious. Sometimes we're not at peace in things because you want to move us on. I pray, Lord, that we would live a spirit-filled, spirit-led life where we're trusting in you for everything, not just relying on our own understanding. Trusting your ways, God, even if we can't understand it completely or, or, or um, 
plan it out the way that we think it should go, that we're trusting in you. Give us that faith, Lord, so that we might experience your goodness, your mercy, your grace, experience you in a more profound way. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, we thank you that we don't have to understand everything. We don't have to use our brains and our experience and our fortes uh, to do your will. Help us, Lord, to depend on you, to realize that you do things in your time. You do things in your ways. We need to trust in you and not lean on our own understanding. Help us, Lord, to be convicted to you, that our hearts would be totally in your hands, and that we would follow your ways, your principles, your guidelines, and to make our character be more like your character. Refine us, Lord, chasten us, uh, purify us, so that we can be more holy, so that we can represent you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mr. Randy. Yes, Reverend Fong, this is the time of our service where we greet our guests. If you are a guest, 